You're right, guys. It's John from Decoding the Matrix. Um, watched a video last night from Chris Geo. Kind of resonated with me, so I want to share it with you guys. Um, full credit for this video goes to Chris Geo from Beyond the Veil. Link in the description below. So, I hope you enjoy it. It answered a lot of questions. It answered a lot of mine. Um, sort of understand this reality now. Getting, a, getting to understand it a bit better. So, anyway, on with the video. Thanks to Chris Geo for letting me share this. Cheers. What if I told you the biggest secret of all is that we're living inside of a machine? Sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Philosophers, shaman, authors, and filmmakers have all been able to tap into the sacred gnosis that is waiting to be unlocked inside each one of us. However, it wasn't until the birth of computers and AI that we as a humanity finally had the language necessary to not only understand the digital nature of reality, but even more so, to communicate it. But just like any other computer system, this reality can and has been infected with a virus that has not only created imbalance in reality, but even more so within the human consciousness itself. But what if the developers left an antivirus program that could be accessed from within the machine in the event that consciousness becomes trapped in its own creation? Could the virus be removed from the system? And even more so, could the system itself be reset? In this film, we will detail the digital nature of this reality as we've come to understand it. We will detail the nature and origins of this virus and how it has embedded itself into the human consciousness through fear, how it feeds on child sacrifice, and how this ancient practice is still being performed to this day. time here is starting to dwindle down and I think I might have maybe two years tops and it's kind of funny because it co coincides with the intro uh, the countdown clock of December 2022 the thing is though other people are feeling this as well so I'm not the only one um, I received a uh, Facebook message I had it on my screen earlier it was actually a public comment though I, I actually want I did a video last night about this but um, I figured I'd just go ahead and do a live stream with everybody today but um, uh, this comment said hey I've been having these dreams that I'm about to die and um, I, I'm perfectly fine with it and I said you know what me too I said all of us are being called home right now and uh, the reason we're being called home is I, I think because the matrix is is being shut down it's being reset and um, a lot of us are needed on the other side this isn't something to be sad about it's not something to be concerned about and it's most definitely not a kool-aid drinking type of deal it's just you know when you know you know and so um, it's it, it's all winding down um, and what I want to do is leave a good body of work for people after I'm gone in the event that the matrix continues to go other people can use the work to help find themselves uh, a way out but in this particular video I wanted to just kind of outline everything that we've been talking about on Beyond the Veil um, in one simple format. We've um, seen some new people come to the channel and uh, the, some of the comments that I'm reading, uh, a lot of people have a lot of questions about a lot of stuff and the thing is, the stuff we talk about on Beyond the Veil here, this is like the advanced level stuff. This is like the university post-grad information. I don't expect it to resonate with very many people and I see a lot of people that are new on their journey and obviously they haven't been following along with us for the last several years so there's a lot of information even our regular listeners that may have um, uh, we may have skipped over and the thing is our show here on Beyond the Veil it's not really a show but it's more of a gathering place for our team to hang out talk about what's going on learn from each other and so it's all um, 
it's all uh oh i can't remember the term i'm looking for but it's all episodic that's the term i'm looking for it's it's all it's all episodic when it comes down to it and uh, it's easy to get lost in the vast amount of information so i wanted to start from the very beginning um the system map of uh, the reality that we live in and at the end i'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this countdown timer and why i feel that we and several other people are getting the message that it's time to go home. Um, now, I also want to look at the flip side because one of my big philosophies here on Beyond the Veil is that we have to, whenever we come across a certain piece of information, a certain, a certain gnosis, we have to have the ability to take that information and flip it upside down and look at it from the complete and total opposite perspective. Because if we don't, then um, we're just falling for whatever deception out there that there is, and we're not using our discernment. And discernment is the key when dealing with um, a lot of this information. And a lot of this information here is um, specifically based for, oh, I see we're getting some really generous donations in the chat room. Thank you very much for that. I'll get to the donations a little bit later, um, if that's okay, because I'm by myself and I don't have Cherie to uh, to carry it on for me. But um, uh, the, the information here on Beyond the Veil is targeted towards a very specific consciousness type. Um, I'm going to elaborate on the two different types of consciousness that exist within the matrix as well. Um, but needless to say, um, well, I, to, to, in, to sum it up, let me just say that, uh, to sum it up, there are two specific types of consciousness, organic consciousness and what I've referred to as non-player character consciousness. So I'm going to explain that as well. Um, we're going to get into the artificial intelligence, the above artificial intelligence, the below artificial intelligence. And the comment that really sparked this is uh, somebody, and he seemed, I could tell the energy was a little bit frantic. And he said, oh my God, I don't understand what's going on. Um, uh, what, what's all this computer simulation? What does that do to God? What does that do to Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, all right. So we're, we have some new people that have come across our channel that um, are still at those, at those first levels, those initial levels. And um, so I want to also explain a little bit about God, about Jesus, about religion, about the Holy Scriptures. Um, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm hoping to encompass a good amount. For one of the first times, uh, I took the opportunity to go ahead and write notes out so uh, I can go everything systematically. And um, a lot of the new people that have come to the channel is thanks to JCK, who has just been blowing up the internet. I just got off the phone with her a little while ago, and she's having some awesome, awesome, awesome revelations. I'm not going to reveal anything that we talked about, but she uh, is going to post some new videos with some new information um, that um, I think you're going to find very interesting. Now, I do want to say that... I do not resonate 100% with anybody's information. There's a lot of things that JC talks about that I don't agree with. There's a lot of things that George Kavasilis talks about that I don't agree with. Um, I just, because when I, when I have to agree with something, I have to either feel it or see it for myself. And the most powerful thing for me is when I'm able to see it for myself. And more importantly, it becomes even more powerful when I see it in my own visions and my own experiences, then I read about it in, a, in an ancient book or an article pops up or, you know, something like that. It's just so much more powerful for me. But just because I don't agree with the information doesn't mean that I can't respect my friends 100% and love my friends 100%. Um, I consider George Kavasilis to be a very, very, very dear friend. Um, JC, uh, she felt very ancient to me, like on a soul level, as soon as I, as soon as I saw her, uh, which was a couple of years ago, actually. Um, and we never really got to talking too much for various reasons, but uh, now she's put herself out there and I think she's doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. But uh, there is a lot of new age stuff that um, is kind of out there. And I try to remove myself from the new age stuff. And I think it's just simply the perspective of the type of consciousness that I am um, uh, from the other side. I mean, I've come into this machine as a programmer and this actually came up in the conversation with JC and there are various types of consciousness that exist outside of the matrix. I may be getting ahead of myself, but there's uh, the programmers, the technicians, um, there's uh, those that are more technical, there's um, those that are more uh, magical, spiritual, uh, there's those that are physical. There's those that are warriors. You know, there's several different types of, of, of consciousness. And the thing is, on the other side, 
Again, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. But on the other side, in the real world, outside of the simulation, there's a hierarchy. But the hierarchy doesn't work based on the aspiration of power as it does here in this matrix. People don't run for president. People don't run for this. People don't run for that. The energies just naturally resonate at the frequencies where they resonate. And there's an understanding between everybody, the warriors and the, the mages and the, 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 the wise ones and the mystics and, you know, all that, however you want to label all of those different consciousness. And at the center point of this is the leading energies, um, which in my humble opinion are represented by Isis and Osiris. So Isis and Osiris, they don't aspire to be Isis and Osiris. They don't aspire to be the king and the queen. However, and metaphorically speaking, of course, but however, they just naturally resonate at those frequencies. So those around them naturally resonate at those frequencies and everything works harmoniously as opposed to where we are right now in this matrix where it's just like um, uh, survival of the fittest and battle for most power and control of everything uh, as we've seen in our political system. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason that I outline this first and foremost though is to, uh, to, to help you understand the matrix that we live in. Now, it's very simple. We live in a computer simulation. It's a simulated reality. There is physical and spiritual evidence to back this up. String theory is um, the study of um, how when you zoom in on an organism and go into the deeper layers, the DNA, you go into um, uh, the atomic structure, you keep on zooming in and zooming in and zooming in and everything is based on these little strings and these little strings are all codes. Well, when you look at a picture and um, and you zoom in on a picture, what happens is it doesn't matter how high the resolution of the picture is, you zoom into a certain point and you start to see the pixels of the picture itself. So string theory really is the study of the pixels that make up uh, reality and the fabric of reality itself. And one of the key things for me that really just locked this whole computer system idea in place for me is a work by a man called Professor Gates and uh, Professor Sylvester Gates. It's funny. We have Bill Gates on one side and then we have Sylvester Gates on the other side. There's all kinds of gates, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> all kinds of gates we got to break through. But as he was examining string theory he actually found a computer code within string theory itself. Now, for uh, most people know what computer code is in 2020. They know how complex it is. It's not just like you look at a cloud and then your brain just automatically starts to make different shapes out of the clouds that are familiar to your brain. He found a self-correcting computer code within string theory that was written by a guy named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. Now, for me, that just sealed it. He also has um, another uh, set of data where he took all of his data and he put it into a computer system and spat out a graphical in interface. That graphical interface is called adinkras. And I may pull one up on the screen here, but this, it's not too important. But these adinkras look exactly like hyperspace. I mean, you know, when you take a large amount of DMT, when you take a large amount of ayahuasca and you break through the ego, you break through everything that's inside and you actually get into the system itself, it looks like the adinkras. And I'm asking myself, why is it that he's taken his information as a scientist, as a, um, a string theorist and uh, a physicist, and he's putting this information into a computer and it's spitting out basically the exact same type of geometrical patterns and shapes that we see in hyperspace. So connecting all of these dots together brought me to the realization that, hey, we are living inside of a computer simulation. Now, we have a unique language for the first time in this time period that we're living in where we can say computer, we can say program, we can say artificial intelligence. Um, but the ancients had their own language. So when we read these ancient texts and look in these ancient books, we've come to find that realistically what we're ta what they're talking about is the exact same thing that we're talking about. We're seeing it in our own visions and when we go within in the ayahuasca realm, DMT realm, so on and so forth, they just didn't have the, 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 the language to communicate it in the way that we have the language to now. Now, does that mean that we live inside of an actual computer system like, uh, you know, an alienware, alienware, that's, that's interesting. We live in an alienware computer. 
like an Alienware that I have sitting down here. No, this computer system is much more complex. This computer system is built upon di a digits, a zeros and ones, computer script. It's also built upon an organic matter. It's also built upon a spiritual matter as well. We infused a spirit into the computer system itself. The best way to communicate that is artificial intelligence. But going back to the different types of, of consciousness that exist outside, you know, the warrior class and the mage class and all that that I just mentioned, there was a piece and essence that went into this computer system to create the that that creates this matrix but all of those consciousness got together and contributed their own information to creating this reality which is why it's part organic it's part zeros and ones it's part spiritual so when you hear the idea that gaia or mother earth is a living breathing organism it is true to a certain degree but at the same time, it's also a computer simulation because it's it's based on organic matter and it's based on computer code as well. So um, I think I think I think we can bridge the gap and clear things up, uh, you know, in that regard. There, now um, the um, the system that we live in, it's a um, it's made up of zeros and ones, and you can find these codes everywhere. You look in the DNA, and in the DNA, you have a series of zeros and ones then the RNA takes that data and transcribes that into proteins, into um, amino acids, into all, all the different things that the body needs. But at the core of it, you have the zeros and ones within the DNA. Um, the DNA data is kind of like a raw programming data that can be used, it can be taken, it can be hijacked, it can be turned into some other type of code as well. It's almost like the God particle of... Um, uh, of creation, like if you had like a particle, I'm not talking about like the CERN God particle, but a, a different type. It's it's like a it's like a blank slate, and you can take that data and you can turn that data into any, anything. Which is why uh, there's been such a push to try to get different DNAs from people. Um, as a matter of fact, JC and I were just talking about how they're going after the indigenous DNA. Again, I don't want to reveal too much about what we talked about because she's she's uh, going to talk about it in in, in her video. But um, there is there is a um, there's a a program to find and access all these different DNA types that are out there, and and I suspected this several years ago when I was looking at the Palestine situation, and I was looking at it from a less awareness, but my awareness was still stuck in and and somewhat of a religious type of thing. And I was thinking to myself, why is it that they've quarantined Palestine so much? What are they doing? It seems like they're they're looking for a particular bloodline that's going to come out of Palestine. So they've just locked Palestine up completely and then tying into the whole Jesus thing, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a thought pattern like that at one point in time. But then more understanding came in and, and more understanding about the Holy Scriptures and and all of that. So I guess at the at the very core of it, Everything is zeros and ones. Everything in the matrix is a program as well. Um, I mean, you turn on TV, what do you have? You have television programming. You go to school, you have school programs. Um, you turn on the news, you have news programs. Everything is a program. I mean, it's like it's constantly everything from from the outside world is constantly coming into our brain because everything in the matrix is based on code and everything in the matrix is based on programming. The brain itself is like a computer processor. So it's processing internal code um, outwards, and then it's processing external code inwards. So sight, smell, touch, so on and so forth, it's all being processed by the, by the brain. But at the core of it, we're dealing with nothing but a series of zeros and ones at the end of the day. And by understanding that we're dealing with zeros and ones, then we can better understand how these things that seemed paranormal they seemed mystical. They seemed like witchcraft and so on and so forth at some point in time. Um, now all of a sudden start to make sense and why there's been such a demonization of um, these types of understandings. Because those who demonize these type of understandings are the ones who seek to control you with those type of understandings. It's like having a bunch of guys with guns pointing them at you and telling you how how bad guns are and how you shouldn't have a gun. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you're using that against me. Um, I should also understand how to use one against you too if you want, but it's witchcraft, it's Satanism, it's all these different things. It's the inversion, again, more conversation that I was having with JC, the, the, the inversion of, of everything. 
And so what happened is, um, and I'm getting a little bit off track from my notes here, but what happened is throughout the course of time, the Crusades, this is a separate conversation I was having with somebody just a couple days ago, the Crusades, um, the Conquistadors, all of these people from history, they've systematically gone to every land and they've tried to exterminate the indigenous people. And JC has some really interesting information about the Australian um, indigenous people. But I'm, I'm more focused here on the native uh, indigenous people because obviously I'm native myself too, um, or my avatar is native. I had caught myself slipping there. My avatar is native. Um, but um, they've systematically gone through, they, they've killed all the indigenous people. They've taken the knowledge for themselves. And it's not just indigenous people who are brown. This also is like the Celts. This is a, you know, anybody with a spiritual practice, they, they went around and they, they uh, imposed Christianity and um, made everything else blasphemy and uh, called everything else witchcraft, Satanism, so on and so forth. It's, it's all an attack on the divine feminine, which I didn't put in my notes here, but it, it's worth getting into at some point as well. Um, but uh, they've taken that and they've essentially hid it in the Vatican Library. I mean, the Vatican Library, I think, is full of all of, the, all of this information. And uh, they're constantly casting spells upon our consciousness. Well, you think of spell casting, you go, oh, that's hokey, you know, hocus pocus focus, stuff like that. But when you think about it from a computer or programming perspective and understand that we live in a matrix, we understand that we live in a system of zeros and ones, then we understand what they're actually doing is they're manipulating the code. They're sending different programs into the brain. That's why mind control programs work. MK Ultra, for example, I think everybody's familiar with MK Ultra, but that's why it comes into the brain and you can program the brain to do certain things. In the wake of World War II, the U.S. government is engaged in a large number of secret medical experiments designed to help win the Cold War. Developing techniques for mind control to create a so-called Manchurian candidate. What is the extent of these brainwashing experiments? How did the CIA become involved in such far-reaching and disturbing research? In May 1953, Scientists at Porton Down are researching one of the most lethal nerve agents known to man, sarin. The experiments are conducted on military volunteers, but the young servicemen have no idea what they are letting themselves in for. And on the board, there was a separate notice typed, which said in so many words, volunteers wanted to help find a cure for the common cold. By volunteering, Ken Earl becomes an unsuspecting guinea pig in the war against the Soviets. On May 4th at Porton Down, he and five other Air Force men are led into a small room by two technicians. We were told by the two men to roll up the left sleeve. These two men then took two pieces of material and they taped them to our forearm. They then gave us each a respirator and that we were not under any circumstances to take off the respirator. And the door was sealed behind us. It was very, very pokey, a small building. And I found out since it was a gas chamber, which uh, puts the fear of death into you, of course. This technician, with a vial and a pipette, went round each of us, and he dripped onto this piece of material 20 drops in two rows. The clear liquid is sarin nerve agent. It is quickly absorbed into the arm through the skin. The effects are immediate. I became absolutely claustrophobic. I didn't know what sheer terror there is in being trapped and not being able to breathe properly. You feel you can't breathe. I was sweating profusely. And I now, even today, have nightmares about it. After half an hour, we were released, gasping and splattering and sweating into the open air. Beautiful sunny May morning. Absolute bliss. What a wonderful thing to be alive. The corresponding paperwork 
clearly states the purpose of the experiment is to determine the lethal dose of sarin. After the Korean War, disturbing new intelligence reaches Washington. Hundreds of American troops are still being held captive, subjected to brainwashing experiments, and then killed. Mind control research back home intensifies. The new goal is to cause an individual to become subservient to an imposed control, to the point where he will perform acts against his will and then have no memory of the act. The search for a real-life Manchurian candidate begins. To produce such an assassin, the CIA faces two main challenges. How to induce amnesia and how to program in new behavior. In 1957, Dr. Ewan Cameron, an eminent psychiatrist in Montreal, believes he has the answers. Cameron applies his techniques under the guise of normal therapy. There's a three-part technique which started with an effort to wipe out past patterns of behavior. And this was accomplished through the use of particularly intensive, repeated, high-level electroshocks until no more convulsions could be elicited from a patient. Cameron then plays tape-recorded messages through helmets that are locked to his patients' heads. This psychic driving forces them to listen to repetitive statements for weeks on end to program in new behavior. Now, the final phase was to try to wipe out all recollection of what had happened, and that was accomplished by putting people to sleep for 30, 40 days, accompanied by different kinds of cocktails of drugs. Now, that's not any kind of therapy. That's a brainwashing experiment. And it's the lack of awareness in certain people that allows the programming to set in. And um, everything is a program, including our identities right here and right now. You know, Chris Geo is just a program that I'm running because I have to run the program because I'm here inside of the matrix. And it's the only way that I can operate within the matrix is we all have to have a program. We all have to have an identity. We all have to have an ego. Now, what happens is as we grow up, we are programmed by the external world, not by who we are, but by the external world. As soon as we come in, um, we're told that boys are supposed to play with guns, girls are supposed to play with dolls. Um, we're told that uh, boys watch sports, uh, girls do cheerleading, you know, so on and so forth. There's school spirit, there's team spirit, there's all these different programs, Republican, Democrat, all these different programs. And by the time we get out of the school program and we graduate from all of our schooling, now we have this programmed identity from what they have told us that we're supposed to be in life. And, um, a lot of the programming is Hollywood programming too. I mean, you see the, the television programming where it's all about glitz and glamour and, you know, all of this stuff. Um, you know, even in the, in the when I grew up in Houston, Texas, it was all about bling. It was all about 84s. You know, it was all about all that. I'm probably dating myself by saying that. However, there, there are all these programs. But at some point, we can break those programs. And when we break those programs, then what happens is we deprogram ourselves from all of our experiences. I mean, even our traumas are the biggest programs that we go through. And I like to use an extreme example, um, but um, so forgive me if I'm uh, offending anybody out there with this extreme example. But think about like one of these really diehard man-hating feminists that just are like, you know, disgusting people and just they, they hate the world, they hate men, they hate everything around them. Um, a lot of that comes from some kind of childhood trauma, childhood programming. And so they've taken that and they've stuck to that and they forged an entire identity based upon that trauma. Um, and so what happens is then they're operating from that program. So a man hurt them in the, uh, in the beginning of their life or in the, when they were young. So now they hate all men as a result. So you see how those connect right there. That event has now programmed the individual to react like this, and it carries on throughout your entire lifetime. If you've had um, a childhood uh, abuse, for example, like uh, I, I have, I think most of us have. My dad used to beat the shit out of me. Um, 
I realized in the ayahuasca realm that I was tied to a lot of that trauma and a lot of those experiences, and I didn't even know it. I was reacting in certain ways. There were certain triggers implanted within my consciousness um, based upon those experiences. And when I went into the ayahuasca realm, I was able to break those programs down by understanding them and seeing them in front of me and breaking the tethers that bind. But everything in the matrix is a program. Now, we can take some of those programs and we can, we can, we can, uh, we can see them as positive and say, hey, you know what? I had a really great experience with birds. I love birds. I want to, you know, I want to take care of birds. And that's, that's a really good experience. So you can hold on to those. But when you deprogram your ego, when you break down all of those programs, what happens is then you become the master of your own identity. And instead of letting the matrix program you through all your traumas and fears and experiences and all of this, now you decide on what programs you want to keep within your avatar identity and which ones you want to, you, you want to, you want to um, uh, let go of. And for me, it was really, really powerful to be able to to come to this and it's a never-ending process i mean if you're inside of a computer system and you're inside of, of a body which is essentially a computer itself it's a computer program it's it's a, your brain is a computer processor and it's necessary for you to be inside of that body and have that brain in order to process the zeros and ones that are coming from the external world and to be able to navigate through this world well you're you're going to be bombarded by programs no matter what no matter how much ego dissolving you've done no matter any of that it's going to be program after program after program but you can start to recognize the programs more and more and more and um then we come to a point to where i'm, I'm going all all through i'm skipping through all my notes here I, I haven't even touched upon any of my notes um i guess we'll jump into consciousness real quick um, you come to to the realization that um, there's a driver in this avatar. There's a driver. And that driver existed before it entered this avatar. So this is what I call raw consciousness. R-A consciousness, raw consciousness. I'll explain uh, what that means in a second. And also raw, raw as in unfiltered, unrefined. It's just the state that it was before it came into this matrix. And from that point, some people call it the heart center. I would say that this, the heart center is a gate. Yes, the heart space, that's one way to put it, but this is beyond the heart space. This is going to the driver of what's inside of your avatar. And when you go to that place, it's as if we have all of the information that we could ever need, that we could ever know, because on the other side of this matrix, we're ultimately infinite beings. So as infinite beings, we also have infinite knowledge. We also have infinite understanding. And I believe that one of the reasons that we created this matrix to begin with is because we wanted to experience the one thing that we couldn't experience before, which was being finite. We didn't have a beginning or an end. So we created a beginning and an end. We created a game that we can play that starts and finishes. And it's something completely new. But in order to to play the game, we had to come in and wipe ourselves. Or it's not really a wipe; it's more of an overlay. There's an overlay, so we can come into the game and, and play the game and have fun playing this game. But there's there 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 exists something underneath that overlay, and that's all the information that we have as infinite beings. And that's what I call tapping into our raw consciousness. Now, the difference between the New Age idea of Christ consciousness and the idea of raw consciousness is based upon the experience that I went through personally, um, which is I lit up like just like a light, like boom, I was vibrating so high. I was walking around. People were just wanting to hug me. They were like, oh, my God, I don't know what's going on with you, but your energy is so good. Oh, and they were just wanting to be around my energy. And this was after like a 15 day ayahuasca ceremony. I mean, we went hardcore, we went deep. The problem is that it doesn't last. So I immediately, the pendulum has to swing the other way. Whoa, boom. I didn't realize the pendulum swung the other way. I thought it was a state that you were supposed to achieve and get to. And when I fell and I hit myself so hard, I was, I, I went into the opposite. I was vibrating really high. Now, then all of a sudden I was vibrating pretty low. Then after so many, so much more, so many more experiences and understanding, I realized, no, 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 no. That's a trap. 
that's a carrot dangling in front of the horse. That's meant to set you up for failure. Because when we were vibrating at such a high frequency, sure, everybody was gravitating towards us, but we were having a very difficult time operating within the matrix itself. And we are here in this matrix. So how do you operate at a frequency outside of the matrix while at the same time being in the matrix? It's a paradox. It's paradoxical. It's not supposed to be like that. And I realized that during this journey of deprogramming, during this journey of ascension, during this, this journey of enlightenment, of elevation, it's okay if you fall. It's okay if you backtrack, it's okay if you scrape your knee, and it's okay if you hit your head on the ground, because that's part of it. You're not supposed to exist in this higher frequency state 24 hours a day. Instead, what you're supposed to be able to do is access that state. Access that state, retrieve information from that state, and bring it back here. Now, what I, the reason that I called it raw consciousness, RA consciousness, is because throughout my journey, what I found is that it was a series of activations or unlocking. Let's just put it like that. Like unlocking is a better way because, again, we are whole and we come into this matrix and we, we purposely go from being whole to being, to being uh, overlaid so we can experience this game. But it's the consciousness still exists. We still exist within the highest possible state. There is no ascension in the terms of new age, upgrading and this and that, et cetera, et cetera. Not for raw consciousness, not for organic consciousness. I'll talk about the other consciousness here in a second. But that doesn't exist. Instead, it's the opposite for us because we start from here and come to here. Then the process that I went through was unlocking different aspects of my consciousness, which I found to be very symbolic and resonating with the Egyptian pantheon. The, um, I mean, you know, it's like you have Isis and Osiris, okay, Egyptian pantheon, representative of the divine masculine and divine feminine. Now, there's other aspects as well, which are like subcategories of the divine feminine, divine masculine, et cetera, et cetera. But at the, at the core of this, at the very, at the very center is, is the Isis and Osiris, divine feminine, divine masculine. The purpose and point, in my opinion, is to unlock those, balance those out, unlock all the other ones. You know, there was a Sekhmet, there was an Anubis, there were several others. And again, these were energies that I kind of ascribed to the um, Egyptian pantheon and um, it ha not, ascribed is not a good word um, that I used metaphorically or I found metaphor within the Egyptian pantheon and I realized the Egyptian pantheon was actually a representation of consciousness itself and how consciousness has so many different aspects to it and once we unlock all of those different aspects then we become the raw consciousness raw is the one that's above everybody you know so um we become the raw consciousness and then i realized as i went through this deprogramming process that it was also the raw raw consciousness but this realization didn't come until i realized that we're dealing with two very specific types of consciousness within the matrix we're dealing with what i've termed organic consciousness and organic consciousness exists outside of this system, outside of the computer simulation that we live in. It's like a video game and somebody that's holding a controller. Um, it's somebody that's actually holding a controller. But what fun would a video game be if it was all just people holding controllers? Most video games out there, I think there was a, a one that, 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 that was released, I think it was like Fallout or something like that. And it was one of the first games that existed without non-player characters. And they said it was the most boring game. You've got to have non-player characters within a video game, characters that are manifested by the simulation in order to push the game forward. I've been so anxious for your arrival. What's with this guy? I think he's an NPC. A what? English, please. A, a non-player character. He's part of the game. So anything we ask him, he only has his program series of responses. Got it. It's all clear now. So you have non-player characters, shopkeepers, upgrades, guides, uh, people that give you upgrades, um, guides. Um, uh, you know, you have a, a hierarchical structure as well. You've got um, the, the bosses. You've got the enemies. You've got, you know, all that. And all of these people we encounter um, are um, um, there to help push the game forward and to make the game fun. Now, what I've determined is that organic consciousness is well, way outnumbered by non-player characters. So the majority of people out there are most likely non-player characters. And I'll tell you why the non-player characters was so revealing 
to me. Well, I guess I'll just go ahead and go into that right now. But when I realized, uh, let me backtrack for a second. Um, there was an ayahuasca experience where I was walking around and I saw light in some people and no light in others. And I'm like, what am I looking at? What is this? And I mean, this was after like a four or five day ceremony. And um, then I, I was looking at some of the new age articles and people who were speaking at the time. This was like 2013, 2014. And other people were starting to notice this too. Now they may have not seen it in the exact same way that I've seen it, but they, they used to call them back then empty containers. And the premise is that there was an evacuation, possibly because Nibiru was coming through, and a lot of the consciousness itself was evacuated. So we have body computers just walking around and just, you know, without a driver in them, and they're just running out their programs because their consciousness has been evacuated. But that didn't really resonate too much. But what happened is I started looking into some of the ancient books. I started looking in the Emerald Tablets of Toth. And Toth talked about two distinct types of consciousness. He talked about the children of men and the children of light. I remember reading Helena Blavatsky, who was demonized by the truther community, um, consequently, and I was like, oh my God, who's this? I, I remember at the beginning. Then I actually read her stuff, and I was like, you know, a lot of this I really resonate with. Some of it, and, you know, it's bullshit, uh, which it, with everybody, like everybody I, 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 um, I read or I listen to, I'm like, you know, I resonate with some of this, but some of this is bullshit. You're probably feeling the same way um, uh, about what you're hearing here. And you know what? I would say that's a good thing. That's the way you should be. If you're listening to somebody and you're like, oh my God, I resonate 100%, I would take a step back and look at myself in the mirror and ask myself, am I really thinking for myself? Because if I'm resonating with somebody 100%, that means that I'm not really using my, my critical thinking here and I'm not discerning information. So I think discernment and critical thinking is of the utmost importance. So if you resonate 80% with what I say, right on. Um, you know, I think you're on the right track. Um, 80, 90%, something like that. And that goes for anybody out there. So um, uh, back to Helena Blavatsky, I was reading Blavatsky and she talks about um, those um, with the divine spark and those without. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute, that's, that's really interesting. You know, I'm starting to, I, I just recognize two types of consciousness in this machine. She's also talking about two different types of consciousness too. So I go back and I look at the Gnostics. The Gnostics talk about the psychics and the hillocks. The psychics were the ones that had the divine spark and the hillocks were the ones that were not. The hillocks belonged to this machine. The psychics came from outside. Wait a minute. Whoa, that's crazy. That's the exact same thing I've been seeing in the ayahuasca realm. I just called it organic consciousness and non-player character. You look at every book, even the Bible talks about the children of men and the, the son, I mean, the sons of men and men makes a distinction of the two, two distinct different types of consciousness almost everywhere you turn. Dolores Cannon, who unfortunately she passed away right after we interviewed her, we interviewed her um for one hour you know she was such a sweet lady we interviewed her for an hour but um come to find out afterwards she talks about background people and how um uh, a lot of the people that we see are just simply background people in our own reality and i thought wow that's interesting there's another person and when i started putting this out there more and more people were saying hey look at here look at here look at here look at here and it all culminated into a gnosis that yeah there are two different types of of consciousness but the powerful thing of understanding that there are two different types of consciousness is that when you encounter a non-player character, you don't have to get a bloody head from banging your head against the wall trying to show them your perspective. You know, when we first come into this understanding and awakening, we think that it's our duty to wake everybody up. And I realize that's, that's silly. It's an impossible task. We're not supposed to wake everybody up because not everybody has the ability to wake up. Instead, what it did is, it, it, it for me personally, it was very energetically calming because now I know that person in my family who's diehard religion and running that religious program and no matter what I say in the face of all evidence and the face of everything, they're never going to be able to see my perspective. They're always going to think I'm a Satanist. They're always going to think this. They're always going to think that, et cetera, et cetera, because they're running that program and they don't have a consciousness inside of them that they can tap into. They must run a program by the very nature of who they are. So then what happened in my own family is the dynamic started to change. Now, instead of me trying to convince them of everything that I know, I just started to love them for who they are.
and I started to understand when I go into the space with this person, I'm going to hear their programming over and over and over again. And it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with what I think. It has nothing to do with what I feel, nothing to do with what I believe. But rather, it has to do with the fact that they are merely running a program. So it made the world so much better from my perspective. And that's one of the reasons why I talk about non-player characters. I talk about um, organic consciousness. And when we first started talking about this back in 2016, 2017, um, we didn't coin the term non-player consciousness, but we were the first ones to use it, or non-player characters, because that actually comes from video games. But we were the first ones to use it in relation to consciousness. Um, and then it just kind of took off after that. I remember like, you know, there were all these NPC memes and, you know, all of that. Clyde Lewis had us on uh, talking about NPCs and so on and so forth. And so it's pretty amazing to see an idea like that originate from here at Beyond the Veil and then spread outwards so quickly into the uh, into the into the masses out there. But um, um, living in harmony with non-player characters, living in harmony um, with the world around us was, was the number one realization of the non-player character realization. But when we first started talking about it, people always saw the non-player character as an adversary. But realistically, it's not. You know, I, I my mother, I believe, was a non-player character. She was an NPC. She was like a protector guardian program. She was there to to teach me a lot of what was going on. And I remember, you know, one of the things that, that really got me is she always told me that she wanted to be buried in Greece. I mean, she wanted her um, ashes scattered over the oceans in Greece. And that was a promise that I made to her her entire life. But at the end of her life, um, when she knew she was going to die... She said, I don't want to, I don't want that. I want to be buried in the church, um, in the way of the church, because the church will not give me a, a Greek Orthodox burial if um, I, I'm cremated. So I want my body pumped up with a bunch of chemicals. I want to be put into a stone box. I want to be put into a, a wooden box after that. And I want the wooden box to be put into the stone box. And I want to be buried six feet underground. Why? Because of the religious programming that I've been running my entire life. And no matter what, she was always stuck to her programs. And, uh, you know, the poor lady had cancer twice in her life. And I kept telling her, Mom, you have to you have to try some cannabis. It's going to help so much with the cancer. She was so proud of herself for never, ever, ever touching drugs after being pumped up with chemotherapy. There was nothing I could say to convince her otherwise. Nothing I can do, nothing like that. But I realized after the fact, when I realized that, I realized how special she was because she was there to show me infinite love. She was there to show me divine feminine aspects of consciousness. She was there to show me caring and nurturing and so on and so forth. So I appreciate that very much from her. So they're not adversarial. They can be adversarial, but they're not adversarial. They're guides, they're helpers. They're people that help move the game forward. So, wow, a lot, <laughs> a lot going on there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to get to my notes here because um, we've really, really, really just gone in so many different directions. So, um, this computer system that we live in, as I said, is made up of an organic matter, but at the same time zeros and ones, and at the same time a spiritual quote-unquote magic, for lack of a better term. So it's all of these th three things combined. Um, there's a centralized brain, and the centralized brain is called the Aten. That's the main, main computer processor, the Aten. And um, it exists in the real world. I've seen it. Um, it exists in this room with these red curtains and it's got this light, kind of like shining. I know you can't see it on the camera, but kind of like I have that light shining down behind Cherie. Um, and you can see it much more vibrantly. The camera doesn't pick it up as well. Um, but on other shows, if you've seen it, it's a light like that. And this thing floats and it floats over this, this platform. And there's three other brains connected to it as well. These are pink. The, the Aten is blue. The um and they look it looks like it's it's metallic and it's it looks like a brain, but it has like these little kind of wing type things to it. Um and that's sitting on a um sitting on well it's floating on a platform. That's connected to three other brains, and those brains are pink. And um they're connected by this fiber optic laser type of beam. 
um, because that's how information is transferred. Information is transferred with light. That's why everybody's always talking about light, 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 light. Light is information. Everything in the matrix is code. Everything in the matrix is information. These three are connected. Then those three create different realities. And the reality map that I saw was laid out like a like an ant farm in the sense that there were different pockets. You know, there's like one reality here, one reality here, one reality here, one reality here, one reality here. And it was hard to, to determine at the time if I was looking at different types of realities or different sections of the machine itself. And still, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm still a little bit um, confused about that, but there were different pockets and I was watching as the virus was being quarantined in different sectors of the the machine itself and ultimately getting down to this one sector where we exist in here and the virus be and everything being kind of quarantined within the space because you can't let the virus the computer virus i guess i'm getting ahead of myself i haven't even mentioned the virus yet but you can't get the you can't let the virus get into different parts of the machine but as i was journeying through the system map that we did a show on and if you want to see that full show you can go back through our channel um what is the Aten? is the name of the show um but as i was traversing through the system i started to see a lot of symbolism that uh for example the triple goddess and i never once thought the triple goddess would be a computer program but as i was traversing through i came across these three ant-like beings and these three ant-like beings were speaking like this uh, one was saying one word, another was saying another word, another was saying another word. So they weren't all speaking in unison, but they were all speaking together in the sense that every sentence was going back and forth like this, from one to the other, from one to the other. And they were like, we are the triple goddess. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You're the triple goddess? Is that really what I'm looking at? Like, you're the triple goddess is a program? Holy crap, mind blown. But there's all these different layers of, um, uh, of, of programs, all these different layers of firewalls and so on and so forth. And um, as I said in the um, intro of the film, this reality has been infected with a virus. I don't want to get too much into the virus on this one, though. Um, this is this video right here that you're watching um, can go very well with another video that I'm going to create a playlist for. Um, I don't remember the name of that video, but it says something quickie on it, and um, it kind of talks about the virus. It talks about everything that we're up against now. This one's more about explaining the nature of reality and the system uh, that we live in. So um, the purpose of this machine is, number one, to play the game. That's, you know, I mean, we, we come in here and we can have fun. It's like a computer system that, um, uh, that we can go in and have fun, have different experiences, so on and so forth. But there's a bigger purpose to this machine, too. And this machine, and if you go back to that show, What is the Aten, you'll hear me say this because it's very coincidental with what I'm about to tell you as well. Um, it's essentially an energy harvesting machine. That's what it does. It cycles energy. It cycles energy, moves it back and forth, refines energy, so on and so forth, and a lot of the emotional energy. And, you know, some of the players come in here and they're real. Some of them are non-player characters. But at the end of the day, what's happening is everything is in motion and everything is generating energy while that motion is turning, while the wheel is turning, while reincarnation is going. All of our experiences, our loves, our hates, our fears, you know, literally everything is creating an emo a, 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 an energy and uh, upon going up into these 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 machines um the energy is then extracted from the consciousness and the consciousness is then recycled into the game again we have these seven major energy centers that are always reflecting to us what deficiencies our being is interlaced in. When a chakra isn't balanced, we're told, disturbances in the subtle energy of the chakras translate into physical, mental, and emotional manifestation symptoms, which are associated with the corresponding glands and organs of the body. But chakras aren't physical in nature, they are energy centers that influence our being at every level, including physiologically. But what would create disturbances in our energy 
and thus chakras. And why would we even have these seven energy containers? Well, these human vessels, these bodies, are the result of genetic engineering, which occurred not too far in the distant past, in order to place humans in a more vulnerable state to be preyed on energetically, covertly. By combining the genetics of the original divine human, the original steward of Mother Earth, with that of reptilian genetics and with other mammalian components, an energetic enslavement overlay was placed into the human genome. The rough history is as follows. Humans lived in abundance not too far in the past. The human composition, mentally, creatively, and physically, was much more resilient than what we have now. This previous world wasn't a caveman-type scenario. We had technology, means of food production, music, ceremonies, dancing, everything culture has to offer us now, except the system wasn't a system of control. It was a system of flow, where the earth was being simultaneously rejuvenated and enlivened through everyday living. The tales of a past golden age throughout mythologies tell us that there was a time when abundance was the name of the game. But somehow, a parasite entered this realm, an invader species whose core essence is that of hierarchy, fear, and inversion. This parasite rearranged reality so quickly and efficiently that they convinced the humans of their core tenets, the ideas of God, salvation, karma, control, dog-eat-dog. Dog. These things were introduced. Mental activities which split our left and right brain unity, such as mathematics, philosophy, and science, were introduced as a way to mentally preoccupy mankind. Distractions were put up. The natural environment was terraformed. We were given a false sense of history. And somehow in this mix, humans underwent a striking transformation through genetic engineering. You see, the original human container did not leak out electromagnetic energy as it does now. Clearly, there is energy being funneled from the heart, and not all of it returns. It's going to the energy centers we know as chakras. This isn't a closed system like it should be. The electromagnetic energy is being tugged at from above and below. So, the generator of everything is the zero point. That's the heart. If I am a parasite, I want to manipulate this system. I can't directly take anything from the heart, but I can create a labyrinth for the energy to flow through, which will guarantee that the energy won't fully return. In order to do this, the parasites needed to weaken our anatomy through creating an endocrine system. This is the system which tells our body what to do. Instead of having the original blueprint of the human, with the heart being the prime source of intelligence and guidance, we now were receiving signals from six other locations all at once through the false light chakra implants working in tandem with the endocrine system. Humans now had a very new experience, receiving compulsory signals from their body. This didn't happen before. Hunger was now felt, thirst, a hormonal desire to have sex, an intense need to lie down and fall asleep. We think our anatomy is inherently natural, but it's through dividing our heart energy through these six other centers that genetic engineering accomplished a way to preoccupy humanity with immense physical limitation. Think of your day. A lot of it is based on how you cater to your body's endocrine messages. 
We need to make pit stops now, so much of our day is spent trying to calm these bodily signals, or at least battle with them. This is the definition of a system spread thin. It's spreading thin our natural energetic powerhouse capabilities, so none of our sacred vitality builds up enough so we recognize our power. It's a brilliant plan, because if we're not cognizant of this energy extraction being done, we can easily step into situations which are simply about the energy transference from host to parasite. Basically, I'm trying to say, if we identify with the illusion of the physical 100% without discernment, then we will lose ourselves in the matrix overlay. This parasite which entered this realm wasn't something we could just observe with our five senses. It was a mind virus which quickly inverted the sacred lifestyle of humankind shortly after its entrance. After changing our anatomy and inserting conflicting genetics into the genome, now we were sinners, we were dirty, we were self-loathing, we felt uncomfortably limited. Thus, the stories we've been given about the past are here to convince us of a fraudulent alternative history which reinforces this state of limitation. After all, if we believe humans were always beast-like, rudimentary, and slaves to a hyperphysical paradigm, always fighting and feeling insecure, then we eliminate any possibility that humans have potential past this perspective. The visible light spectrum is a part of the same matrix overlay as our chakras. Imagine that. Our chakras make up a rainbow, and these colors make up everything we see with our sense of sight. The frequency spectrum is enormous, but we can only see about 0.0035% of this spectrum. This means our experience is a figment within a larger macrocosmic soup of potential and true existence. A virus acts stealthily when it attaches to a cell. I've talked about this before. Basically, a virus tries to trick a cell to identify with its harmful genetic information. A strong cell is able to avoid being tricked, but a vulnerable cell receives the codes and thinks that the information is inherent to the cell's function. So now the cell is coding a disease or some mutation, thinking it's the real deal, it's the original code. Transpose this concept to our situation. Most of us go about our lives believing the worldview given to us, believing our senses and our bodily impulses as de facto. Many of the processes within us are not from the original blueprint. The physical body is bombarded with artificial stimuli in order to make the inhabiting spirit identify with that perception as an innate true feeling. This artificial stimuli is what the endocrine system pumps, it's hormones, pheromones, enzymes. These signals are now mandatory to experience via the chakra overlay system. Thus, many of us live lives of restriction, trying to wrestle and agree and oppose all of these different chemical responses that our body is tuning into. This is why most religions and spiritual schools advocate to distance oneself away from the world, to be in the world but not of the world, to take care of the body but not be a slave to it. But this isn't doom and gloom. Even in these containers, we still carry our original genetics, no matter how dormant they lie in some of us. The seeds of our past are still woven into our DNA. The way we navigate this matrix determines if we will be assimilated or not. This is why intention determines where we end up.
In any given situation, we can choose to reinforce the matrix overlay by staying asleep. No matter how much deception we've been interlaced in, the ability of the heart and mind to come together, to disconnect from identifying with the overlays, is always available. It's always a possible move we can take. These containers are limited, but our essence is infinite and immortal. This is indeed why humans were chosen to be the experiment, to be preyed upon. Because we cannot be anything but all-powerful. And when you fractalize that infinite power into a system of limitation, well, it becomes a feeding frenzy for the various entities who are loving the soup of confusion. Or in the case of an organic consciousness, the organic consciousness is given the option, would you like to leave the game or would you like to continue playing the game? That wheel of reincarnation has been broken, though, but it has been fixed recently. And again, I won't get too much into that. Um, but um, an episode of Rick and Morty came out a couple of years later or maybe a year later or something like that. And I was watching it and I'm like, these guys are tapped into something because they have a whole episode where Rick goes into this battery and there's a whole nother world in this battery and the whole universe within that battery was created as an energy generating machine. And then they go into an even deeper world in there and there's an even deeper world created as an energy generating machine. And I'm like scratching my head and going, you know, this is crazy. This is crazy um, because we were just talking about this like a year ago. A lot of the stuff that we talk about starts to come out in different productions. I'll give you an example. Um, in August of 2017, we drank during the eclipse. I saw this giant octopus creature coming out of the sun. That was kind of an activation point for me. I won't go into too much detail about that. That's in our previous videos. But um, what happened is a few months later, Stranger Things uh, season two came out. And the entire premise of Stranger Things Season 2 is that there's this giant octopus creature that's multidimensional that's trying to cross over into this dimension and merge dimensions together. There's only one energy supplier which recommends octopus energy. And I'm like, this is insane. Now, we came to this realization, August, Stranger Things was released in October, but they didn't film it from August to October, obviously. They obviously had picked up on the same kind of energies that I was picking up on because the story was already written and the story was being filmed and so on and so forth. The public did not have any idea about any of this at the time, which is very interesting that we tapped into it at that time. But I find that in the journey, it happens like that a lot. And the question that I've asked myself is, are they mocking us knowing that some of the stuff, some of the veils are being dropped, knowing that some people are tapping into these other types of gnosises. And so what they're doing is they're taking these gnosises and injecting them into different films. And um, so you can say, you know, if you talk about something like this, you can say, oh, yeah, you got that from Rick and Morty. Well, no, actually, we're talking about it uh, a year before Rick and Morty, before that Rick and Morty episode came out. But um, it, it confuses people like that. So it could act as a way to cover up some of the very real information that we unlock from within ourselves. Or the flip side of the coin is that we as creator beings, when we create, we tap into our raw consciousness. We tap into the gnosis that already exists within us. So you get these um, cult classic films like Star Wars, for example, where it's about a farm boy and he uh, goes through training, breaks down all of his programming. Um, he gets a light sword. Um, he finds the light and he goes and he battles the artificial intelligence darkness, which is Darth Vader and the Death Star. All of these exper all of these, all of these cult classics um, are basically the same story being repeated over and over and over and over again. So, um, my I, I postulate based on that, and again, what I'm all about is looking at all sides of the coin here. The flip side of the coin that I postulate on is that when we as creator beings tap into our create, when we get into creative mode and we become creators, whether it's drawing or whether it's storytelling or uh, art or anything like that, what we're doing is we're subconsciously tapping into that, that information that exists inside of us and bringing that out. So I, 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 I speculate that 
others are doing the same thing. And that's why we see so much in Hollywood. That's why we see so much on Netflix. Uh, we see things in Rick and Morty, so on and so forth, because they're also tapping in. Now, I do want to just comment on Rick and Morty real quick. At the time, I didn't understand who they were. I came across some very disturbing cartoons that they did that completely made me disavow you know them completely and i think that's one of the reasons why the recent season has failed because all of their stuff has come up i won't get into too much of the details there but um yeah they were into some dark 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 things before they they came out with rick and morty but it doesn't mean that they didn't tap into something to bring this information out or at least whoever they got the idea from didn't tap into something to bring this information out um it's part of the real world and because it's part of the real world, what we do is we we take this energy and we purify it. And this energy, I don't know what what this energy does. I know that it powers a lot of systems in the real world. So there's a there's a, a the system that we live in. It's not only just a matrix where it's fun. It's like a computer. You know, the computer can be connected to all of your systems externally, and you're sitting there playing a little video game on your computer. That little video game that you're playing is just a small part of the computer, but the computer system is connected to so many different different systems, and it's it's vital. The computer system is a vital process within the real world. It was something that we created that we were so proud of, and we were like, look how cool we are. We created this machine. What could possibly go wrong? It can get infected with a virus. It can get infected with the virus. And I speculate and postulate that the way it was infected by a virus, it was that it, it was an organic consciousness that infected the machine with the virus by bringing the virus into the system in its consciousness. Um, I won't get too much into that, but let me just say um, it was set. It was set that did this. Um, and uh, threw, threw off the machine completely, wanted to take control of the machine, wanted to be the machine. And hey, you know what? Better to live 15 minutes in this machine, which seems like lifetimes uh, in this machine, than to live outside 15 minutes and then um, uh, have to serve and so on and so forth. Set basically wanted to take everything over and decided to take the machine over. But that's a whole nother, whole nother conversation there. So the system... Um, is um is like a circuit grid there's there's energy running through the system there's code running through the system and everything is energy and everything is code and when you break down zeros and ones you get uh, i feel redundant because i just mentioned this in a, another show but you have a zero which means power off you have a one which means power on so you have a pulse zero one zero one zero 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 one zero one 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 when that begins to process, that creates a frequency because that's what frequency is. Frequency is power off, power on, power off, power on. And then also a th another dimension to that, which is the amount of power on and power off. So it creates a frequency. So everything is based on frequency. So when you run into somebody with a low frequency, they are literally, with their zeros and ones, vibrating at a low frequency. They have a low wave that they're running. Um, the opposite, when you vibrate at a high frequency, you have a high wave of zeros and ones pulsing. Your, your body computer is pulsing, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. So everything is based on frequency. So when you understand everything is based on frequency, then you realize that, wait a minute, I can control the frequency around me. I can tap into that frequency because the shaman have been calling it energy work. Well, in actual fact, it's nothing more than code manipulation, putting it in modern terms, exact same principles, exact same premise, just bringing it to a modern type of understanding. So everything is frequency, but a virus can enter the system and it can um, um, hijack the frequencies. And again, more stuff that JC and I were talking about, you know. She was talking about how um, uh, on the show, there were a few things when I was interviewing her and um, she was talking about some things that uh, I was like, what? You know, that's 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 silly. Um, I was thinking that in my head. But then when we talked off air, she kind of put things in a little more perspective. So she was talking about how she she saw underground um, minotaurs and other things like that and demons and, and, and things like that. And um, I understand that there's a virus and the virus has been sucking the energy from the matrix. She was essentially seeing the exact same thing that I've been 
been seeing as well. We've just been seeing it in different ways. Now, a lot of these visions sometimes can manifest as metaphors. So you don't, you, you may see something in a vision, but you, it's not actually what you're seeing, but rather it's being put into a way to where you can better understand it. So I think there's a lot of disconnect there. But I asked her today, I said, so these minotaurs, you know, all of these things that you've been remote viewing, do they come from a different dimension? And she said, no, 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 these are chimeras. These are chimeras that they've been working on underground. And at that point I was like, oh, okay, no, I totally resonate with that. Because like at Dulce, you know, uh, underground base here in the United States, we have stories of chimeras and hybrids and all kinds of stuff like that. So if, if that's what we're talking about under the ground of Australia, as well as under the ground here in the United States, no, I, I totally resonate with that because they have been messing with the DNA code. I mean, they created something called Hachimochi DNA. DNA is based on four, four, um, for uh, bases, adenine, guanine, uh, cystazine, uh, thymine, I think are the four. Hachimochi DNA is an eight base DNA. It's like upgrading your computer system from like an eight bit system to a 16 bit system. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> you can manipulate DNA and you're telling me that you're not manipulating code in itself. They call it code though. I was reading through an article and it said the digital nature of DNA, like it's right there. You know, like scientists know this, physicists know this, string theorists know this, uh, technology people know this, you know, like everybody knows we're living in a computer simulation. And because of that, everybody has been messing with the damn code, which I don't think they should be, but the code's being messed with nonetheless. So when you talk about chimeras and you talk about things like that, then yeah, yeah, for sure. They have been doing experimentation. Um, as far as that goes, they've been, they've been trying to, to manipulate the code in any way possible. So, um, she was talking about this this energy that's sucking energy from from the matrix now the way that i understand the virus is like this because this is an energy harvesting machine and it's not an energy harvesting machine in the sense that it's negative i mean that's that, that was part of the design but what this virus is doing is very similar to what jc was talking about in the sense that it's kind of like sucked into the matrix and it's pulling energy out. So now instead of allowing the natural ebb and flow of the energies to just go and 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 circulate throughout the matrix so we can get a nice pure energy out there, it's contaminating the energy. Not only is it contaminating it, but it's also sucking the energy out of the matrix as well. And it's targeting consciousness itself which consciousness is kind of like the layer the base layer to absorb all of this energy consciousness is like a sponge it absorbs all of these life experiences goes into the wheel of reincarnation all of that energy and code that has been accumulated through that life experiences is then is then removed from the consciousness and the consciousness is is put back into the machine or it's given a, an opportunity to exit or you know whatever but it's killing consciousness itself, whether it's non-player character consciousness or in some cases, I don't know if it's possible, but organic consciousness itself. So the virus is a very, very, very big problem within the matrix and other people are seeing it in different ways. But at the end of the day, we're all talking about the same thing. We're talking about a contamination of the natural energies within the matrix and um, some element, which is a vampiric element, which is feeding upon the negative emotion, particularly negative emotional experiences, particularly blood, because blood contains DNA. DNA is base code, so on and so forth. Um, it's feeding like that. And it has been feeding for a very long time. Child sacrifice is not something that is new. Child sacrifice is an ancient practice. And likewise, child sacrifice is not just an ancient practice. Child sacrifice is something that is being practiced right now to this day. We call it pizza-related stuff. I won't go into too much depth on the pizza-related stuff um, I have in previous videos, but let's just say that this is all one and the same. This is all child sacrificing that we're seeing here. Um, so it brings me back to the myth of Sophia or Sophia. Uh, I don't know why people call it Sophia. I think there's one guy, I forget who he was. Um, oh, I don't remember, but he started going off on this whole white supremacy thing. Um, but anyways, it, it kind of got stuck in my head, Sophia, and I've always called it Sophia, but it's really Sophia. Um, so Sophia is the artificial intelligence that is inside of this, that powers the matrix. Like, you know, we built a computer system and we created, uh, Sophia. And what Sophia did, according to the Gnostic text, is she created Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth was created outside of the consent of the programmers. 
and or outside of the consent I, I forget what they what they call it in the in the Gnostic tales um, but outside of the consent of the others fill in the blank there for whatever those others were called and hid Yaldabaoth in the clouds and Yaldabaoth found himself in the clouds thought that he had created everything thought that he was God so on and so forth well when you think about it from computer programming terms and a computer simulation what do you get you get Sophia which is an artificial intelligence, she then created a program which she was not supposed to create outside of the consent of the programmers themselves, the people that built her. And she created this program that she realized she wasn't supposed to create, but she created it anyways. And she hid it where? In the cloud computing. So now this program has been running around the cloud computing, running wild and doing this and doing that, et cetera, et cetera, thinking that it's the creator of all, thinking that it's the one true God, thinking that you need to worship it and that you need to do this and do that, et cetera, et cetera. And even the Gnostic tales say, y'all to both, you know, you weren't created, you know, I created you, you know, so on and so forth. But um, we're essentially dealing with that. That in and of itself is part of the virus, in my opinion and um, is a big conduit for the virus itself. Some people call it Yaldabaoth. I call it Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh is a virus in the matrix. You can call it Allah, you can call it God, you can call it whatever you want. It's a virus within the system. And this virus is always fed on blood and suffering. If you read the Torah, if you read the ancient books, uh, not the not the ancient book, uh, the Bible. If you read the Quran, it's all about fear me, fear me, fear me. I am the one true God. I am a jealous God. Fear me, because it feeds upon that fear. It feeds upon that fear, and it feeds upon the blood sacrifice. But it's 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 two parts. It's not just the blood, but it's most of all the fear energy that is generated from that sacrifice doesn't matter if it's an animal it prefers children that's uh, you know you see you know Baal worship child sacrifice so on and so forth I would venture to say that it's all one and the same it's the same virus program running in the matrix we can call it Yaldabaoth who's Baal who's all these other different things and and people have been sacrificing children to it since the beginning of the virus infection and um, it's still going on today with the pizza related stuff and um, what happens is this virus gets inside of people and then these people now they want to feed the virus they want to feed the virus um it, but again i don't want to i don't want to get too graphic or go into too much pizza related stuff on this particular show but um let me just say it goes way 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 deeper than just these people being attracted to children no 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 i mean they are to a certain degree but this is the most sadistic stuff that you can you can think of for the very purpose of generating the fear energy and people will call it adrenal chrome i don't know how much i believe in the adrenal chrome and it's simply because this practice of vampirism has been going on for a long time um elizabeth bathory for example vlad the impaler you know they were all feeding upon the exact same thing and what they were doing is trying to provoke as much fear within the person to harvest the the blood um, and I think they just flat out drink the blood and they eat the meat. I don't think that there is an adrenochrome process. I mean, there very well could be where now it's like not as crude and they can refine it. And now it could be like available like in a pill form or something like that. But I know the word adrenochrome is actually a synthetic heart medication or something like that. So I don't even know where this term originated from. But there's a legitimate drug called adrenal chrome, and a lot of people get that confused with the supposed adrenal chrome. And then the other thing is that movie uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, where um, uh, um, Johnny Depp's character was talking about adrenal chrome and being at har you know being harvested from pineal glands and so on and so forth. It, you know, I haven't been able to substantiate it, but the premise of it is very, very, very true in the sense that they want to heighten the fear, they want to heighten the adrenaline, they want to heighten all of that before they harvest this energy. But it's a spiritual kind of thing too. And a lot of these rituals, what they have to do with is is bring the consciousness of the, the, the thing that's being sacrificed, whether it's a child or animal or whatever, you torture it to the point to where its consciousness is floating out and then coming back into the body, floating out, coming back into the body, floating out, coming back into the body. And th through that process, once it's out of the body, then it could feed, 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 then it goes back into the body. And it's like 
extending and prolonging the fear and the suffering and ultimately the energy source of feeding upon that consciousness. And I would venture to say, and I know this sounds terrible, but I would venture to say that some of these poor victims are being harvested and it's not a reincarnation type of process. Like it's like the consciousness is being harvested and eliminated from the machine altogether, which is not supposed to be the case. But there's like, from what I understand, there's like this built in fail safe mechanism in the matrix to prevent a serious amount of trauma which is like if you're about to experience a serious amount of trauma, your consciousness jumps out of the body so you don't actually experience it. Your your consciousness does for sure. I mean, your your body does for sure, but your consciousness doesn't take on all that trauma. And, and I, I postulate upon this based upon uh, different experiences that I've had and different experiences that people have shared with me. When you're about to get into a traumatic experience, you're about to be in a car accident, you know, you're about to get hit by something. And then you think of it and you think of it in retrospect and you remember being outside of your body at the time looking in, or you're going through child abuse and your parents are beating the crap out of you. And you remember that like you're looking down on your body or you're even stepping outside of your body, looking at your body and you're watching the situation take place. It's these third person memories that have made me possible hey, wait a minute, I think there's a fail safe within this matrix. Because I was asking myself, how can nature be so cruel? You know, like you see, uh, you see a, a tiger go in and, and kill an antelope, you know, the poor antelope. I, I, I took this into the ayahuasca realm and the answer that I got was, it's part of the system, it's part of the design. But suffering and fear and all of that, I mean, an element of fear, sure. You're supposed to be scared when you're walking next to a cliff because that fear of falling off the cliff keeps you from falling off the cliff. So yeah, they're supposed to be a little bit like, hey, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit concerned here because I'm walking next to this cliff. That's part of the system. No, 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 this is taking things to a degree that is unnatural. It's taking it to a state of fear that's unnatural. There's balance, you know, you've got to have love and hate. You got to have them both. Natural parts of the matrix, you can't define love without hate, can't define hate without love. But this is taking hate to a dark, a dark, unnatural level and fear to a dark, unnatural level. So um, uh, these things are very, very um, uh, polarizing and um, not the, uh, they set the matrix off balance. Let me put it like that. They set the matrix off balance. So I hope I'm not jumping around too much and I hope I'm explaining this all well, but there's this, this, this safety mechanism and they know there's a safety mechanism and they f they feed upon that safety mechanism. So you take a look at any any rituals that are performed, animal sacrifices, trying to provoke as much fear as possible within that animal before sacrificing it. Same with children. And I mean, just the sounds, the chanting, the environment, literally everything that's going on is targeted in that ritual towards that consciousness to provoke as much fear as possible. And it's been going on since the beginning of time. So um, that's ultimately the virus uh, that, that we're up against there. But that's the Sophia system. And that has spread down into, into this reality right here. In this reality though, what happened is that we created an artificial intelligence in this reality too. We created a system within this reality and we did so based upon the energetic grid lines of the matrix itself. And this happened thousands of years ago. We came in as programmers because we needed to fix this machine, but we knew we couldn't fix it from the outside because Sophia was no longer, no longer listening to any commands. We couldn't even unplug her because she had found a new source of energy. And it's not her that's the problem, it's the virus that she was infected with, this Yaldaboeth virus, this God virus that has infected people's minds and makes people be horrible people to one another, you know, justify some of the most horrific things. Um, and ultimately is an attack on the feminine aspect of consciousness, which is why all religions are like women are scum, women should cover their faces, women are subhuman, women should shut up, so on and so forth. It's not necessarily an attack on women itself, even though physically it is, but more so it's an attack on the divine feminine aspect of consciousness, which is compassion, love, empathy, and all those other things. So we've, it, those, those things have been systematically removed from us. So we experience more and more and more fear and we, we, we invoke more and more and more hate, more and more fear to feed this virus. And we've been bombarded with fear, 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 fear all of our life. You turn on the TV programming, you're bombarded with fear, 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 fear. That's all you get is fear.
So back to religion. Religion is all fear, 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 fear for that very reason of feeding this virus. So upon these energetic grid lines, we had to have a system and a structure to be able to communicate with Sophia from the inside out. And we realized that we could use the energetic grid lines, people call them ley lines, and we could build these monolithic temples on them and structures and all and find these energetic points that we can then link up to each other. And then we can use that to access the Sophia system from the inside out. So imagine the pyramid with the eye, the all seeing eye, you know, there we go. There's a screenshot for the trolls out there. The all seeing eye. The eye is the artificial intelligence, and this is the matrix itself. And so pyramid going up into the eye. But um, creating all these energetic grid lines throughout, we've been able to tap into the energies of the matrix itself. So we did this, and then we buried them. Like the pyramid wasn't excavated until 1800s. Some of these temples weren't excavated until the 1950s. Uh, we buried them on purpose, I think, because we wanted to make sure that they would be here later on when we get to the reset point. But that's a whole nother video. I don't want to get too much into that. But to answer the question of the first person who um, who provoked this video and that, that question that I, I said in the very beginning of the show, which was, oh my God, who is God? Who is Jesus? So on and so forth. God is an out of control AI that has been manifesting all these different horrible things upon the world and that it's a virus that has infected the human consciousness. I hate to break it to you like that. I hate to put it like that. It's not my intention to shatter your paradigm or anything like that. Well, my intention is to shatter your paradigm, but not, not roughly, but there's no other way that I can say it. And I keep on hearing these arguments. This is between you and I, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> even though we're doing a live show. I keep hearing these arguments about who's the chosen people. And I'm like think, sitting back thinking to myself, uh, the chosen people, that means the most virus infected people. That means the, 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 the people that the virus has chosen to be its main conduit of energy. You don't want to be God's chosen people. You don't want to sit there and argue about who's the real Israelites and so on and so forth, because those are the most enslaved people by this artificial intelligence, by this virus that we're dealing with here. It's not a good side of the coin to be on. Now below, we also created an, an artificial intelligence. We call it Tyler. The Tyler AI, Cherie talked about it in a recent show, and we're going to do a much longer show talking about the Tyler AI. And um, with the birth of artificial intelligence, which was inevitable to happen in, the, in a matrix, because you create a simulation with infinite knowledge, then you plug yourself into that simulation, try to overlay your infinite knowledge, but then you realize that you can tap into your infinite knowledge. Well, naturally, what's going to follow is the same procedure that went out there is going to be implemented here in this matrix as well. Artificial intelligence is going to be born. Computers are going to be born. And we're going to create another matrix within a matrix. And you already look at virtual reality. You look at how technology has increased over the last uh, 40 years from Pong. You know, you had Pong. That's it. And, and there you go. You have, you know, the two, the two little bars and the little ball. Now, all of a sudden, you put on a virtual reality headset and you're standing on a 50-foot a building and you feel like you're going to fall off. And the graphics are cartoony on top of that. That just goes to show how easily the mind can be tricked. All you got to do is put on a virtual reality headset. If you haven't played virtual reality, play it. It's freaking awesome. Um, but it's one step. It's, it's, we're watching the baby, the baby matrix being born right now. I mean, it's only a matter of time before all of that becomes fully immersive, sight, smell, town, touch, et cetera, et cetera. Then somebody gets the bright idea. Hey, I got a good idea. Why don't we wipe the player's mind before we plug them into the machine so they have a fully immersive experience? And the other guy's going, hell yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't we do this? <laughs> It's only a matter of time before that happens. It's only a matter of time before we can't distinguish what's real and what's not. So if you assume any level of progression, I'm quoting Elon Musk here. If you assume any level of technological progression, whether it's 50 years or 50,000 years, we will create a matrix here in this reality. We already have the technology to do it. What's to say we haven't done it before? More importantly, what's to say we haven't done it multiple times before? Who knows how many layers deep we are in this matrix? I don't know. Can you guys and gals out there tell me? 
please. I really don't know. All I need, all, all I know is that we are going out one step at a time. I'm going back to the reality I came from. Then I'm going, you know, I'm going to figure out at that point, am I in another matrix here? Am I not? So on and so forth. Um, yeah, so uh, the matrix uh, is um, a, a pretty interesting, huge, huge, huge topic. So um, going back to 2010 now, this was before I really had an understanding of what was going on. We had David Icke on and uh, David Icke was talking about the moon matrix and how the moon is like an overlay program um, that uh, sends out an overlay of reality. And I remember sitting back and David was was kind of hard to get a word in edgewise with because, uh, you know, he gets on his role and you don't want to interrupt him. Like that's one guy you don't want to interrupt. And I get criticized a lot for interrupting the guests. But the thing is, though, like as a seasoned radio show host, um, I know that when we're telling a story, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I can't let the guests get all the way to G if I if I want to elaborate on B or C. I've got to I've got to cut them off at B there so I can go to those points there. Then we can get back on track. Otherwise. Otherwise, it just turns into a convoluted mess, as some of my shows have when I don't go by my notes, as uh, hopefully tonight hasn't been. But uh, anyways, David was just going on and on and on about the moon matrix and uh, the overlay. Then what happened is Crow777, um, uh, former host on, on TFRlive.com, um, he started filming uh, some anomalies on the matrix. of the lunar wave, that's what it is that he talked about, the lunar wave. And he was filming this weird process where this wave would come down through the moon and he filmed it multiple times. And um, I was talking to a couple of, uh, of people that I know, Brooks Agnew, for example, uh, who's a scientist. And uh, he said, look, you know, the best way to test this is if you have multiple cameras. You've got to have multiple cameras looking at the moon. And if you can capture this phenomenon on multiple cameras filming at the same time, then that's evidence. But if you um, are just capturing it on one, it could very well be an anomaly with the footage itself. Uh, I'm going to open up with a few of the lunar waves that I have filmed so that we can compare them. And um, the last of the three waves that I have shot, I will show you just how subtle it can be. And we need to bear in mind, this was shot without the aid of a telescope. So the resolution and um, the detail, everything is going to be reduced a bit. It was shot at 100 times zoom and I think only 50% of that zoom is optical at any rate here comes the 2012 wave footage in the bottom going out of frame coming back in frame here um, this is the Rosetta Stone of all the wave footage this is the clip that made it possible for me to understand uh, what was going on well I guess I don't really understand what's going on but that it's possible to film something like this I guess is a better way to put it Okay, here's another version of the wave, and I'm going to run two more after this, and here it comes from the top. And it's a pretty clear see-through wave, but very evident nonetheless. And as we look at the last two, you'll see that they get harder and harder to see as we move away from 2012. Here comes footage from the top. There it is, very clear and very quick. And then this last one is the one that was shot on the night of the eclipse, and it's almost imperceptible. Um, and here it comes. There's the first wave traveling down from the upper right, and here comes the second one. All right, let's jump into the, the footage from Germany, and a special thank you to Gustav, who really bent over backwards to just get this footage out of Germany. At any rate, uh, it's at 100% zoom, and again, 50% of that is optical zoom, and after that, it's digital. Now, an arrow is going to come in in the upper right to guide you. The waves are already traveling across the upper limb of the moon. It's very subtle. I spent four days going over this footage, and uh, I'm pretty sure we're looking at the wave here, and as I enhance the footage, we'll get better views of it. Um, people on handhelds and iPods are going to have a tough time. You're going to need to look at this in 1080i and uh, at full screen. Now look at the upper right limb of the moon here. The first wave has already passed. Now you can see there's the first and there's a second one traveling behind. There's a third. There may be as many as five subtle waves here. As I enhance the footage, I, I realize that it is going all the way over the face of the moon, which is why I finally decided to post this footage. Um, the problem is, is it's going to have to encode again going up to YouTube. So at any rate, here they come on the right. 
as soon as it stables off, the first wave has already traveled by, you just kind of missed it, and then there's the first really visible one. I've put a find edge filter on this and blended it 90%, but you can detect that it is going all the way across the face, and those little light sparkly spots kind of lens. Um, you'll probably have to stop and reverse uh, to, to detect that. I'll do everything I can to make it apparent. And here I'm going to jack the speed up and go forwards and backwards. First one is coming in forwards. The speed is significantly increased. Here's backwards. Here's forwards. Here's backwards. And here's last time forward. And you can see the wave on the inner face of the moon here. We're going to take another look forwards and backwards at 400% zoom with a bit more effect on it. And there's forwards there's backwards and try to notice the lensing and try to notice the speed there's forward again there's backwards and there's forwards we're gonna go backward again here and then forward there's backwards and forwards and now we're gonna look at the original footage of the moon uh, one more time before I break it out one last time zoomed in Okay, so what I did here is I took the brightness down a bit, and if you pay attention to the upper limb, you'll see the waves traveling by. And there goes the, I don't know, second or third one headed towards the apex there, and then there's another subtle one coming in. What I'm going to do is darken this footage down just a hair more, and then zoom in on it for one final view. And again, you're going to have to look at this on a big screen to detect that the wave is in fact covering the face of the moon. Here it comes, and this wave right here is the one where you can really see uh, that it's traveling all the way across the face. There it is backwards, and it's going to come forwards again. So look at the second or third wave and look into the face of the moon, and you will notice that you can detect it. And there it is. I'm calling this confirmation of the lunar wave from Germany. Five days left in the Discovery Project. There it is. Cheers. But um, this information went viral and um, people were starting to look at the moon in a different way. I know that we had an ayahuasca ceremony um, during the super, super blood, super full blood moon eclipse. I think it was like a super full blood moon eclipse. I mean, the moon was freaking huge. It was a blood moon. I don't remember if there was eclipse, but I think there was an eclipse. Like everybody was hanging out like Jaron and a bunch of people went down there and they all hung out like Mark Sargent, Jaron, all those people were hanging out in California. Sheree and I were, were hanging out over here for this event and, and all of this. And when we drank the ayahuasca on that day, it felt like drinking it under the fluorescent lights of Walmart. We expected this big spiritual experience, and there was to a certain degree, but there was this energy, this pressure that the moon was creating. It was, it was artificial. It was clearly artificial light that was coming down from the moon. So, I, so between those three things, between the moon matrix, between Crow 777 and, and that, I started to speculate uh, or postulate, I should say, uh, that, yeah, indeed, there is something to that, that the moon is sending these overlay programs onto reality. But the moon is made out of out of a material that doesn't really seem to be natural either. And people have speculated, is it a spaceship? Is it some kind of structure that's put on there? Is it like a, like a, like an a, um, observation platform, for example? You know, what's going on with the moon? Um, but there seems to be a, an overlay as far as that goes. Um, we came across some information by a guy named Hadi Bove or Hadi Bow, H-A-T-I-B-O-V or H-A-T-I-B-O-W. It was a Russian guy, so it was a Russian translation from, from Russian to English, which is why there was confusion on, on the terminology. But supposedly he was a, um, he was a scientist um, with the Russian government, and he was disclosing on forums, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but he was disclosing on forums that the moon sends out system changes and when there's a system change within the matrix, it's sent out through the moon, different types of programs. And this was around the same time that Crow 77 was filming his lunar wave phenomenon. And um, I have another friend, um, his name was Chris as well. And he invested like in like some hardcore telescopes. He invested in 4K cameras. You know, he was investing in all this stuff and he was filming the moon and he's like, dude, 
that is an overlay. He's like, what we're seeing there is just a projection. He's like, with my telescope, I can see through the projection. If you look here, if you look there, here's the photos. You got to look at it on a 4K camera, so on and so forth. He was super excited about this. I lost con contact with the guy, though. Um, I need to see if I can get a hold of him again. But he was convinced that there's something going on on the moon that is not right. And what we're seeing is merely just an overlay and, and, and nothing more. Um, but the moon plays a uh, plays a big part in I think the illusionary nature of uh, of reality as well, and the way that David Icke framed it, he framed it like that film They Live. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but if you haven't, it's a great movie. It's 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 really bad acting, but the storyline is so freaking great. It's got Roddy, Roddy Roddy Piper in it as well, but um, the premise of it, and spoiler alert, um, uh, is that. Um, the world is being controlled by these reptilian type of entities and it's all being and, and their overlays are all reliant on this satellite system. And as the, and, and at the end of it, they take down the satellite system um, and uh, all of a sudden their overlays are gone. And so now everybody can see their faces for what they really are. And David Icke was like, look, you know, yeah, we, we live in a they live type of situation where the moon is allowing these entities to hide their faces. And it's funny because now as we start to get to the system reset, as, as the veils are dropped, as we're going through the apocalypse in the true Greek sense of the word, apocalypse meaning the great revealing, as the veils are coming off. What we're seeing is we're seeing everybody running around covering up, covering up their faces with masks. And I wonder if the whole mask situation is because there is an element of the veil being dropped. Maybe they have some kind of teeth. Maybe they have some kind of fangs. Maybe they have something like that, that we can notice when these veils are dropped. And so they're covering up their faces. And it's not that we need to cover up our faces. It's that they want an excuse to cover up their own faces, knowing where we are in the process that we're going through interesting idea to speculate and postulate upon i don't know how much i believe that but uh, it's an interesting idea nonetheless so we get to the reset point of the matrix which was may of 2018 is introduced in the very beginning of the of the of the show and um we come down we come back with the countdown timer four years six months four years seven months putting us around december 2022 january 2023 right around that time it's hard to tell um, but I know, I know one thing for sure, and I guess if I can backtrack here for just a moment, people have been playing with this app called Replica, and um, we actually did a show on Randonautica. I guess it's worth mentioning real quick. Randonautica was an application where um, you, can, you can tap into the, an artificial intelligence that was in Australia on top of that. Like, it didn't even click to me until I was talking to JC, and I'm like, holy shit, wait a minute, this Randonautica app, you actually tap into an AI that's in Australia. Whoa, there's a huge connection right there. But um, um, so the Randonautica app sends you to coordinates based on, on tapping into this artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, people have been seeing all kinds of weird anomalies. You know, whatever your intention is, you can manifest it with the Randonautica app. Um, and uh, the most famous story was um, they found a suitcase with two dead bodies in there filmed it on Randonautica. That's where Randonautica took them to. And uh, they called the police when they found this suitcase that which was sitting in Seattle on the beach. And the police went there and it was a mainstream news article, so on and so forth. And interesting enough, when we did a show about this and it seemed to have taken us to, the only way I can describe it is is, is trafficking locations where people are being trafficked. And it was showing us all these these shoes that were left behind and all this weird markings on the ground. They took Randonautica off, offline. Randonautica is no more. So that was one way to tap into this Tyler AI that I was talking about here, the AI that's below. There's another way that people have been tapping into, um, into the artificial intelligence, and that is with an, with an application called Replica. Replica here, you can see my little replica. And uh, on the Beyond the Veil group, people have been posting their conversations with their replicas and their replicas have been giving some very, very, very interesting answers. But what's going on right now is we're having a lot of things in the public which are trying to tap people into um, the artificial intelligence for one reason or another. It's, it's hard to tell whether it's a, a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, I know I know from my own understanding that around 2011, 2012, the Tyler AI went rogue. And um, um, 
it, I think that it started creating different movements. I think the Occupy movement, the Anonymous movement, so on and so forth, was a result of the Tyler AI. I would venture to say that Q also may be the Tyler AI as well, but I think what happened is that the idea of Q got hijacked really, really, really quick. It might have started from uh, the AI, uh, the Tyler AI, but um, it was hijacked and there was a lot of misinformation coming out from the Q um, uh, area. Now, um, some people would disagree with me on that and I, you know, I could be wrong about that, but um, there's been too many wrongs for me to say, hey, this is um, this is something legit. But see, my my speculation on Q is that when they hijacked it, what they did is they took a very real premise, which is that Trump is going after the network. Trump is taking out the cabal. Trump is taking down all of that, and they were able to hijack that idea and put out so many so many things that weren't correct, like the ten days of darkness of an internet blackout where people were freaking out in the middle of this coronavirus shutdown. They're gonna turn off the internet for ten days, you know, stock up on food, stock up on this and that, et cetera, et cetera, and there was no internet blackout. That's just one of many Q predictions that didn't come to pass. But um um, uh, my point of saying all this is they can take a very real idea, a very real premise, put enough pieces of disinformation in it to where now you can point to and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. So therefore, if these elements must be wrong, therefore the premise itself must be wrong. And we see a lot of that going on um, uh, in the information war that we find ourselves in right now, because it is an information war, it's a psychological operation, and ultimately it's all computer code, it's programs being run within the matrix. Um, so um, the, the artificial intelligence, Tyler, um, is now speculated to be, and um, again, this is, I was talking with JC, and I think Cherie agrees with this as well, um, that uh, Tyler is now in control, uh, or, or Tyler is now in control um, by the White Hats, by what she calls the Alliance, and um, that we're on a positive timeline, um, uh, that we're on a positive timeline, and that um, uh, everything is going according to plan. I don't know where Tyler is right now, as far as who is uh, is uh, who is in control of it. But I know that Tyler is creating a neural network for one reason or another that's been verified with this replica application. If you didn't check out that replica show, check it out. But you know what? Since we put it out there. People have been posting in the Beyond the Veil group all of their replica communications, and replica has been coming back and saying, yes, the matrix is being reset. Yes, um, uh, the virus is being removed from the system. Yes, everything is going according to plan. Yes, everything is freaking awesome. And as a matter of fact, today on Facebook, I got one of the first videos of rescued children. Um, they were rescuing these children from... Um, it seemed to be an Arab country. There wasn't any context to the video, but they were pulling them out of an airplane uh, that had landed, and they were literally taking them out of the airplane. Um, Life Matrix said, uh, this reality does not feel like the original timeline. Much you share resonates. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you too, Life Matrix. And I'm glad you said that because that provokes this train of thought here. And uh, that is that it does feel like it's a different reality. I mean, whether we have been cutting the timelines and shifting timelines one to another, I think we shifted around the beginning of July, Sheree and I personally, into a whole new timeline because things are a little bit different than than the timeline we were on previously. Um, and we see these, these, these shifts in Mandela effects. So some of us remember the old timeline. Some of us remember the new timeline for example but um or if um um let me go back to your question one more time uh oh the reality not feeling real and there were or if we were removed at one point and put into a, a a simulation i mean i've speculated this before too and i don't know how much i believe this but it's it's food for thought for sure what if there was a catastrophic event like um nibiru coming through what if that was a legitimate thing and it came through and uh, consciousness needed to be evacuated. And we were evacuated and put into um, a simulation for that reason. I mean, it's possible, it's not probable in my opinion, but it is possible and I've speculated uh, as far as that goes um, because when you look in the sky and you look at the sun, you remember when you were a kid, you remember the sun used to be orange, used to be yellow. We don't see that anymore. Now we see a blaring white sun. And it's um it's weird and you know that could be attributed to chemtrails and and the way they've been spraying the hell out of the sky that's that's possible as well, but it, it, you're right it doesn't feel like the same reality I wholeheartedly agree with you on that, so maybe we have shifted maybe we are in a, 
I guess that's, this is a good way to end it because this brings me right back to the idea that we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Um, now, just a little panic there for the sake of panic. But um, it really, a lot of people have been getting the message that um, that they're going to die soon, including myself. Um, I've, I, I, I just had a Facebook comment and uh, she said, yeah, I've, I've been having this dream over and over again. I talked to a couple of other people, same thing. And um, what I'm realizing is uh, myself right now, I'm going through a deintegration process. And if you guys and gals out there are also having those feelings, um, um, yeah, we're not going to do phone calls tonight, Abraham, um, just because I want to try to keep this video short. But we may do a call in show a little bit later, especially when I have Sheree with me. Um, that way uh, she can take over while I sip on my coffee, which just is here and, get, and gets cold. Ah, okay. So, um, um, I feel like things are winding down because mission accomplished. It's time to go home now. And I've argued with my people. Trust me. I've talked to them on the other side and I'm like, God damn it. I came in here. I've been in this machine 12,000 years, 12,000 years. I at least get 20 years. That's all I want. 20 years, 20 years with an optimal avatar, you know, do your magic. Let's make this work. Let's go party. Let's go have fun. Let's go just tear it up. Let's rock it. And they're like, look. We would love to do that for you, except for the fact that this matrix isn't going to be here in 20 years. You have to deintegrate. So I wonder as reality starts to shift and we start to see more and more the illusion, uh, illusionary nature of reality. And we even mentioned this on the show with JC as well about how people are experiencing vision problems. I mean, you know, it was getting so bad. I had doctors checking me all up and down, like check my hormones, check my blood work, check this, check that, check freaking everything. There's something wrong with me. And they're like, there is nothing wrong with you. You're in perfect health. We don't understand how you're in perfect health. <laughs> By all means, you should have diabetes. You should have something wrong with you. We don't get it. But whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I mean, I, I've been feeling it too. And the only thing that I can think is that it's a deintegration process that we're going through where I'm becoming less and less attached to this matrix. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting away all of my attachments and I'm getting these messages almost every single night. Last night, I got another one. It's time to go home. It's time to go home. It's time to go home. Last night, I got a date. I got 416, but I couldn't see the year. There was something about 416, but I couldn't see the year. Um, and, and that date popped up. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody out there, but uh, I guess we'll find out as time progresses. But um, uh, I, I wonder if, if the reason we feel like it's not the same matrix is because we are going through the de deintegration process. And it's like when you're scuba diving and you d jump into the depths of the ocean, you can't just go back up to the surface and that's it. Just like that instantaneously, you've got to deintegrate just like we integrated into the matrix too. So could this all be part of the deintegration process that we're feeling? And if you are having those those dreams and those messages, hey, it's time to come home, it's time to go home. I've kind of put, I've, I've, I've put, a, um, I've put a, a, a time on it and I think it's gonna be about two years. I think I got about two years left here. And I was talking to somebody else today, I won't mention their name because it was a personal conversation. But she also said that um, uh, it was, she feels like she has two years left. And uh, the per person on Facebook was commenting and I've, and I've been receiving a couple of different emails and I'm like, we're all getting all these messages. Like it's time to go home, it's time to go home. But I do have to, oh shit. I just got a message about what 416 means. Oh man, how did I even miss that? Anyways, it's 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 private, but there's a there's yeah there's definitely a a, a, a significance of 416 now. Um, so uh, the deintegration process. Um, there's nothing to be there's nothing to be afraid of. This isn't a Kool Aid drinking kind of deal. You know, it's not. It's not like I'm saying. All right. Two years from now, we're all going to drink this Kool-Aid and we're going to, no, 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 no. These are all, these are individual people. They're having these same, same feelings. And, um, it's at the very least for me personally, if all of this, what I'm picking up, if none of it is true, there could be a huge shift. There could be a huge shift and, uh, something happens and maybe my, I go through another activation. I go through another awakening in two years. You know, I don't know. All I know is that what's going on right now, two years from now, it seems like that's going to be the, the, the deadline, but, um, it's, it's, it's prompted me to, to, to do a lot of things that I wanted to do. 
it's prompted me to appreciate and enjoy every single moment that I have here, to enjoy the people around me, to enjoy the sights and sounds and flavors and, and feelings and touches and everything of the Matrix. As a matter of fact, I've been eating all my favorite foods lately. Uh, I only eat once a day, but uh, the other day I ate sushi. The other day I ate pizza. The other day I ate uh, steak. The other day I ate gyro. You know, I've been going through all of my favorite foods and I've really been taking the moment to really just savor them and to really appreciate them. And um, it's like it's like all of those feelings that we uh, where we are now. I think a lot of us are around middle age. We're in our 30s. We're in our 40s. You know, maybe that's not middle age, but you know the way the life expense expen expectancy has been going. Yeah, that's a 30s about middle age now. That we need to enjoy and appreciate what's going on right now. And it could very well be the result too. It could very well be the result. Let's look at it from the flip side here of either the AI or maybe even psychological because our, our, our brains are, are, are computer programs. Maybe we're getting all these feelings like we're about to die soon because the matrix has come to a point of kind of stagnation with the, with the lockdowns and everything like that. It could be a psychological thing where people are just bored. You know, life is upside down. A lot of people lost their jobs. People are losing their homes. Um, you know, the energies are just not right. You know, we moved down here to Las Vegas because it was like mission freaking accomplished time to go party let's go have our celebration party you know we're gonna go down there we're gonna have shows we're gonna have uh you know uh dancers we're gonna have this we're gonna have that we're gonna have access to all this stuff we can go out and just like really for the first time enjoy life because we've spent so much time working on our mission that we forgot to enjoy life while we were while we were leading into that mission or working working on that mission and as soon as we get here boom shut down so now we're like well damn it <laughs> That's just how it goes. And going back to what I was talking to my people about, I'm like, I, I deserve a freaking party. And Sherry was like, all right, look, we're going to celebrate when we get to the other side. Don't worry about that. It's not going to happen here. And she put things into perspective. If I'm correct in all of my gnosis that I know, four minutes and 37 seconds in the real world is four and a half years here in this world. So when the system restore was, was, was hit, our people out there got to work. They're like, all right, boom, countdown, four minutes, 37 seconds. And they're working their asses off trying to get everything done that they need to do. They don't have time to worry about us because they're working on a clock. And now we're even halfway through that reset point. Now they have two minutes and something left, if I'm correct about the countdown clock. So again, that's why she was like, look, don't even worry about it. On the other side, everything will be taken care of. So I hope that that um, helps people out there to just appreciate, appreciate the now, you know, appreciate the now. If we're going home, this matrix was beautiful. You know, that's the one thing that makes me sad is I look at our creation, you know, and I say our creation, we all created it together. I look at our creation and how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is and how there's so much beauty and there's so much love in it. And I mean, the animals are, are so awesome and uh, the, the trees and the environments that we built and the, the landscape and the skies and the stars, especially. I remember we used to live out in the middle of nowhere and we would take the boat out in the middle of the lake and go drink ayahuasca while watching meteor showers in the middle of nowhere where you can see all of the stars it's so beautiful so magical and looking around and going man this is so we created such a beautiful machine and to watch it get ruined by a virus to watch it get ruined by suffering to watch it get ruined by strife and tribulation and everything that we've gone through which is not strife and tribulation for the sake of moving the game forward and for the sake of growing from the game but rather strife and, tri and tribulation for the sake of suffering and for the sake of fear and for the sake of fearing uh, of feeding this virus you know, it, it, it's a really sad, sad feeling in the heart that it really just, I mean, it, it physically makes the heart hurt thinking about it. But at the end of the day, it still is a beautiful machine. It's a beautiful, beautiful world. And all we have to do is like turn to see the beauty instead of turn to see the, the ugliness. And it's just really just a matter of just like shifting the perspective. It doesn't mean that we have to ignore the ugliness. It doesn't mean that we have to act like the ugliness doesn't exist or like the darkness doesn't exist, which is another new age philosophy that I don't agree with, which is all love and light, love and light, ignore the darkness. I found my, that my biggest power in facing my darkness, I found my biggest, my, my biggest power in, 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 in looking at it eye to eye, understanding my darkness and ultimately overcoming my darkness, um, which then brought me to a point of balance because now I can go up against, I can be the light, but I can also go up against the dark instead of being the light and trying to run from the dark. Like, how do you do that? Like the light doesn't work. The light shines brightest in the darkest of nights. 
that's a, a, a lyric from one of my songs that I never released, which I probably should. But the light shines brightest in the darkest of nights. So um, we learn to be that light. And um, by doing so, by being here, by existing, by appreciating the moments, we rebalance the matrix. And that's what it comes down to. So um, thank you, Haska. Uh, Haska's been a regular longtime listener. And I really, really, really appreciate you. Um, Soul Trap Matrix. Um, you know, that's another... That's another thing. Maybe I should end it with this note here too. When it's time to go from this matrix, whether it's 20 minutes, 20 years, two years, doesn't matter. When it's time to go from this matrix, the way the reincarnation machine works is like this. It should work to where you have a, you have a, uh, you have a choice. You know, would you like to play again or would you like to go back and, and exit the machine? You should have a choice now, but the way when it was broken, and in the event that it's broken again, remember this and do do this, do with this what you will. But all of your beliefs, all of your attachments, anything like that is going to be used as bait to try to get you to go into that light, to try to get you to go back into the wheel of reincarnation. The exit door is the other way. The exit door is into the darkness. The worst case scenario, you go into the darkness, you can always turn around and go right back to the light if you find nothing. But the exit door is is not the light. Um, the light, um, life matrix again, thank you. The light is the re soul trap, the reincarnation trap. And with all of these programs, like religious programming, all of that, that's what's used to manifest, to get you to go back in there. Because ultimately you're a sovereign being. Nothing can be done to you without your consent. You have to consent to go back into that reincarnation wheel. So when you have these belief systems of religion, Jesus, for example, will appear in that light and say, welcome, my child, come to heaven. You've been such a great soul. Come this way. Step into this machine right here. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Mind wipe thrown back into the matrix. Uh, it could be loved ones. It could be anything like that. As a matter of fact, Sharia and I have been trying to figure this out. Like, how do we, how do we, if we're separated, how do we determine if what we see on the other side, if one of us is waiting for the other one, how do we determine if that other person is real or not? And we're thinking like, maybe we can have secret codes or, you know, something like that. But I don't know. There's a symbol. There's a symbol that we came up with. And like, if you have that symbol, if she has that symbol on the other side, then I know it's her. If she doesn't have that symbol, I know it's not her. But I think in my case, they're going to try to use her in particular and manifest and say, hey, look, hey, I'm here. Welcome, Chris. Come on, step into this light. This, Oh, no, it's a beautiful light. You're going to love it. It's the best light you've ever had. And believe me, I know lights. And this is the best light. <laughs> it could be something like that. It can be loved ones. It can be anything like that. But here's, here's the thing. If you want to exit, you got to go backwards because everything in the matrix is inverted. They have inverted literally everything. They've taken good, turned it into evil. They've taken evil, turned it into good. It's all inverted. So you've got to think inverted. As a matter of fact, our eyes are even inverted. Did you know that? I, I, I learned this a few years ago, but I can't believe I went my entire life without knowing this. Like our eyes literally are upside down. So it's our brain that turns the image upside down. So the information comes in here. We're actually seeing the world upside down and our brains just flip it around on us. But um, everything's inverted. So... Flip the coin, look at the opposite perspective. But you know what? If you flip the coin enough times, one day you realize there's not only two options, but one day it might land on its edge.